We'll hear argument next this morning in case 11-1447, Kuntz versus St. John's River Water Management District. Mr. Beard. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. This case is about the extent to which Nolan and Dolan review should be made available to individuals to challenge excessive exactions imposed as conditions to land use approval. Here, before he could make small use of his property, Koi Kuntz was told by the district that he had to finance enhancements to 50 acres of well, public let's, o- let's back up. When he asked for a permit, he voluntarily said, I, as mitigation for the loss of wetlands, I'm going to voluntarily create a conserv- conservation easement on the rest of my property. So he recognized from day one that there had to be some mitigation for what he was seeking to do in the permit. Is that right? That is correct. With his application, uh, Justice Ginsburg, he did offer uh, mitiga- mitigation in the form of a conservation easement on most of his property. And if he had offered nothing, and he, if he just said, I want this permit to develop my land, and the agency said, you've offered no mitigation, we deny your permit, would he have a claim? If there was no condition attached to the permit denial, then there would be no claim, although it would be up to the district under Nolan and Dolan to make the individualized determination both of the amount of impact to wetlands and the amount necessary to offset. Suppose he just put in the application no mitigating um, no mitigation of any kind, and the agency says no. You recognize that he would have no claim, right? That he, that he had an obligation to mitigate. It depends, Your Honor. If the denial was based on the idea that he was obligated to offer mitigation, and that was the extent of the district's communication with him, in other words, that the district told him, you must offer us something. We won't tell you what. And we'll let you decide what you want to offer in mitigation. If that was in the record and that was the — and the result of that was a permit denial because Mr. Kuhn said, for example, well, gee whiz, I don't know how much I need to mitigate for. You haven't told me. I still believe there would be a Dolan violation because in Dolan the Court made clear there has to be an individualized determination. For what? For what? You wouldn't, you wouldn't know what property was taken. He wouldn't you're, know. You're, you're posing a situation in which he never came forward with any suggestion. They never came forward with any suggestion. You say he still has a cause of action for a taking? Not a taking for, of what? Not for a taking, Your Honor. But he, he may have a cause of action under Nolan and Dolan for the imposition of an unconstitutional condition that may not be the contours of which may not be known. But the, the fact that this district told him you need to well, I think the other side says that, that you may have such a cause of action here. Excuse me, I didn't understand. Wouldn't, wouldn't the other side in this case acknowledge that you have such a co- that you may have such a cause of action here? Yes, Your Honor. I believe they, well, their argument But is they're just saying you don't have a cause of action for a taking. That is correct. They're, they're saying that we don't have a cause of action for a taking. Of course, in Nolan and Dolan, there was no transfer of property from the applicant to the relevant agencies. As this Court will recall, in both Nolan and Dolan, there was an imposition of an exaction, and immediately the applicant in both cases sued to prevent the unlawful exaction from being constant. Counsel, I've had a problem with your argument, okay? From the record, it's very clear that a conservation offer is not considered mitigation because there's still a net loss of wetlands. The policy is abundantly clear, stated, and undisputed. Okay? So, given that policy, why are we even in this case? Meaning, whether there was an exaction or no exaction or whatever happened in terms of the denial, you couldn't win on your offer because the policy of the state was clear and, in my mind, unassailable. 
we have to preserve wetlands, conservation of other wetlands is not enough. Mitigation means make sure that we get a net gain of wetlands. So why are we here? Justice Sotomayor, we don't contest the legitimacy of the policy, of course, in preserving wetlands, nor do we contest, for that matter, the ratios that the district has uh, imposed via its regulations. It is undisputed. The trial court found below, the Court of Appeal affirmed, and the finding was undisturbed in the Florida Supreme Court that, in fact, the off-site mitigation, that part of the mitigation that went beyond the conservation easement, was in excess. It violated Nolan and Dolan. So the underlying factual findings are not in dispute. I think you, um, I think you have a problem there, Ms. Beard, because if you look at the record, the record is very clear that it was not that the district didn't come back and say, take it or leave it. You, you improve our wetlands or you get no permit. There was, and if you, they sent out in the respondent's brief at pages 13 to 15, oh, at least half a dozen, maybe more. The, the, the district said, here are several ways, several ways that you could sufficiently offset the adverse impact. And some of them had nothing to do with improving the government's own land. It's, it's so it, we can't, we really can't say this was a take it or leave it. Either you do the improvement that we're asking you to do or you get no permit. What do you do with the, the, the fact that, as the appendix certainly bears out, that the district offered a range, it offered many, many ways that this permit might be granted, and then it says, and you're free to come up with some other, something else. Justice Ginsburg, it's true that there were negotiations and that a range of offers were made. On Mr. Kuntz's application to use 3.7 acres of his property in conjunction with the uh, conservation easement, the district made a final decision denying him his permit because he would not go beyond the easement and offer off-site mitigation. And not, that's in- not because he wouldn't go beyond what he was offering, but um, that's some of these options. What, one was that he um, — that he — adjust the size of his project, that he make it smaller. The, the, the staff suggested eliminating — no, that was, that's a different one. But there was one that suggested he, that he reduce the scale. The petitioner reduced the scale of his project to one acre and preserve the rest with the conservation easement. Now, if that — if we took that, uh, would you have any, any case here? I'm sorry, Justice If they Ginsburg, said, we'll give, you, we'll give you a permit if you reduce the scale of your project to one acre and then preserve the rest by a conservation easement. Unlikely not, Your Honor, because the trial court did conclude, based on the evidence, that he was having minimal impact on any viable wetlands. And so even a reduction in the size of the project with an increase in the amount of mitigation would have a fortiori gone beyond even what we have in this case. The, the Court of Appeal made clear as a matter of law that Mr. Kuntz did, was entitled to a determination on the application he submitted. He submitted that application, and as the district admitted in a pretrial uh, statement right before trial, the denials were based exclusively, and this is a quote, the denials were based <coughs> exclusively on the fact that the plaintiff would not provide additional mitigation to offset impacts from the proposed project. Mr. Beer, could I go back to Justice Ginsburg's first question and make sure I understand your answer to it? Suppose that the State just had a a, a policy that said, uh, we're concerned about wetlands. In order to develop your piece of property, you have to come forward with a proposal 
a mitigation proposal and an adequate mitigation proposal. And then it gives some guidance about what an adequate mitigation proposal would mean, but it really leaves it up to the landowner. And the landowner says, sorry, I'm not giving you anything. I think I should be able to develop this on my own without providing any mitigation. Is that — and 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 the State says, well, then, sorry, you don't get a permit. Is that a taking? Does the man have a takings claim? I heard you answer the question, yes. My answer was that he may have a Nolan Dolan claim. I, I don't want to get confused about the term taking, because taking can imply many kinds of well, regulatory I thought, takings I, That's the next question I was going to ask you, because my understanding of Nolan and Dolan was that it assumed the condition, if taken alone, would constitute a taking. Do you disagree with that? I do not disagree with that, Your Honor. Okay. So then you need a taking someplace in the picture. Isn't that right? Nolan Dolan says this is how we analyze takings in the context of a permit scheme. So we have to look for a taking. So in my example, where is the taking? This was Justice Ginsburg's example. Where right. is the taking? And, and I think that's correct, that, that under Nolan and Dolan, you would have to have a condition that was imposed on you. My only point was, would it be lawful or would there be a problem in the district shifting its burden onto the applicant and saying, we're not going to establish what mitigation is required, or we're not going to establish what the impacts are. We'll leave that up to you. You give us what you think is, is necessary. Why well, is suppose that the district did, did have, as I think it did here, a uniform policy that for every acre you develop, you have to preserve 10, wetland, 10 acres of wetlands. And then two cases, both hypothetical. One is somebody has a 100-acre parcel, and uh, they want to uh, develop five acres, then they have 50 acres that they mit mitigate for wetland. The other person uh, has only one acre, uh, and he wants to, and he has to develop the whole acre. Can the district then say, we'll give you the one-acre development permit if you reclaim wetlands on 10 other acres that you — that we can designate for you elsewhere? The hypothetical being designed to point out whether or not the crux of your argument is that he had to go off, off site. The crux is not that he had to go off site, but that, that did play into the trial court's analysis as to the connection between his impact and what was being required. And there was testimony below that there was no connection there. And the fact that the mitigation was four to seven miles away played into the analysis as to whether there was a connection. But so in my hypothetical, you would not would, — would there be a violation in my hypothetical, as, as you understood it? it? It depends, Your Honor, because you'd have to determine what, in each respective hypothetical, what the impact was actually to the wetlands, and then determine what the appropriate How do you normally mitigation. decide whether the agency has done that right or not? Excuse Ass me? How do you normally decide? Let's assume Justice Kagan's question or Justice Ginsburg's question. No, it just says, come to us with a mitigation plan. And you say, this is what I offer and it's enough. And they say, no, it's not enough, denied. Would you go through the state administrative process to figure out whether that was <coughs> arbitrary and capricious, whether it was a Penn Central <coughs> violation? What would you do with that claim in the normal circumstance? Justice Kennedy's question. In the normal circumstance, if there was no condition imposed, no, there would not be a Nolan and Dolan claim. There may be another kind of claim, say, under Penn Central, and that could be brought. It wouldn't have to be brought via administrative remedies if there was a final agency action. It would be an inverse con condemnation. Co correct. It could be an inverse condemnation type of a claim. So, so. What I think might be driving some of these questions, is the district court says, just as you say, had Kuntz offered additional mitigation, the additional, would have cost $10,000, he would have gotten the permit. That's what he said. So then you look back to see what additional mitigation. And here we have in the record, at least that my law clerk finds, you know, that the they went to Kuntz and they said, here are some choices. Install a subsurface stormwater management system in the development, I mean, right on your land, or reduce the size to one acre, or eliminate the filling of side slope areas, or replace 15 culverts and eliminate a ditch system somewhere else, or, or uh, enhance 50 acres somewhere else. Now, at that point, 
When they all, and, then, and then they said, won't you negotiate for 30 more days? Maybe we can find some other things. He says, no, I'll bring a lawsuit. Okay. Now, I absolutely can see a Penn Central claim there. You see, but the land is it, uh, what we're talking about is not some land somewhere off the site. We're talking about his land. If, after all, they said you have to leave all the coal in the mine to hold up the ceiling, we know what I'm referring to, then they go too far. And here, if we looked at all these conditions proposed and said, you know, this is just terrible, they don't do it for anybody else, your client's the only one, it bears no relation, just, oh, it just goes too far, you win under Penn Central. So I can see the framework here. I'm not saying you're going to win, but I got it clear what the framework is. But suddenly you bring this Nolan Dolan business into it, and I get confused. And the reason is because there was a different piece of land in Nolan and Dolan. The piece of land that was different was an easement. In front of the, and an easement is a piece of property in Nolan. And there was a bike path in Dolan, right across his property. So, so I don't see how Nolan and Dolan have to do with this. I see everything that Penn Central has to do with it. And that grows out of the nature of, of what was being offered. You're saying what they're offering you is simply going too far. Okay, I got that conceptually. I ask this question because all these briefs are about Nolan and Dolan, and I don't understand what they have to do with it. I must be missing something. So that's what Breyer, I'm asking. Justice Breyer, Nolan and Dolan fundamentally are are about whether a property owner has been singled out to bear public burdens that, in fairness and justice. But, of course, they're land claims because they took a piece of land, which everybody assumes right in front of his house, and said, you've got to let everybody from the beaches walk back and forth from one beach in the north to another one in the south, and they're going to walk over your land. And the court said, you can't take his land unless you have a nexus to some public purpose that is related to his building the house. I got it. I just don't see what it has to do with this case. Because you, you can have an unconstitutional condition imposed on your right to do something in this case, uh, make use of your property. Of course you can. And the in fact, there's too much coal. That's an unconstitutional condition. It goes too far, and there is a framework called Penn Central which deals with it. Penn Central is a special takings case that goes to the question of whether a regulation of the use of property that is sought to be developed has gone too far so as to affect the taking. Penn Central is Which, not — How does that not address going too far? You just said it. If, if this is unrelated to the, if the denial of your permit of all uses of your land, and you're saying that's the problem, which is I still have a use, I just want more, um, why does that entitle you to your lost profits? When were you ever entitled to start with the claim that somehow you're entitled to a permit? as a matter of law. We're un entitled under the unconstitutional conditions doctrine to not have to pay bear a public burden that has no bearing on the impact that we're trying to use on our property. Yeah, that's and fine. That, uh, that, that would enable you to uh, uh, challenge the denial of the permit, saying it's based upon an unconstitutional condition. But how does it, how does it enable you to say there's been a taking? What has been taken? What has, been t what has been taken, in effect, is his funds that have to be put now to a public use, the enhancement of 50 acres of public wetlands. And there is nothing in the takings clause, nothing. It hasn't, no been, it hasn't been taken. I mean, he turned it down. Nothing was taken to Nolan and Dolan either. What was proposed there, though, was a the, threat of a taking. The, the, the uh, uh, permit was granted in Nolan and Dolan. And, and the condition attached to the permit, therefore, took effect, namely that you had to uh, dedicate this easement uh, over, your, over your beach, whereas, uh, as my colleague pointed out, anybody could walk back and forth, barefooted. Yeah. <laughs> Justice Scalia, and Nolan and Dolan, there was approval, approval with conditions. There were no permits issued, and that's, that's an important distinction to make, that most agencies, including this one, you approve a permit with, a condi with conditions, which means we will give you your permits as soon as you comply. 
which is substantively the same as saying we won't give you your permits until you say yes to our condition. Right, look, we the same question. I, I just want an answer to my question. And for the purposes of this question, I am assuming enormously in your favor. I am assuming that this set of conditions is the worst thing since sliced bread. All right. I, I, I think they're t- all right. I'm assuming that in your favor. All right. Sliced bread is supposed to be good. No, no, it's been proved bad. But, the, 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 but, but in any case, the, 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 the point is, you see, I assume that in your favor. I'm trying to figure out the conceptual framework. I assume that in your favor. I assume whether they didn't issue the permit and would have, but they haven't quite, or maybe they have, or, means nothing. Now, having assumed that, it seems to me what your argument is, is that this is a form of regulatory taking of the kind that Holmes was talking about. And that... Uh, that's what was going on in, in Penn Central. And so we simply looked to see if it went too far, whatever. The lower courts could do that. I got that part. Now, I want you to answer the question, which is, am I right? Is there another part, a different part to this case, called the Nolan Dolan part? And, and it, explain that to me. That's why I asked the question. I want to hear what you're going to say. Justice Breyer, there is another part, a very distinct part, And that part goes to the question of the condition that produced the denial. So there there are actually two parts here. There's the the conditioning of your permit. In other words, we will not issue you permits unless you agree to perform off-site mitigation. Now, the question under Nolan and Dolan is, was that condition constitutional? Was he asked to give up something that the state or the district in this case should not have asked him to give up in exchange for his right to use his property. Now, it's true, as, as Justice Breyer, you mentioned, that the permit denial and whether that affects a regulatory taking of his land, of the thing he wants to use, that's an entirely different question, and it may raise another kind of claim, another kind of taking claim. But the crux of the claim that was litigated in this case from the trial court all the way up to the Florida Supreme Court is, was the condition to perform off-site mitigation, and that was accepted as true by the courts below, that this was a condition that had been — Suppose the record just doesn't bear that out. The record shows that it wasn't one option. They gave him a laundry list of things he could do. Some, some of them having nothing, whatever, to do anything off his own property. Suppose the, the, whatever the district court might have said, the record shows that the agency said, here are six, seven things you could do. Come up with something else if you have something else. And some of them had absolutely nothing to do with other property. We agree that there were negotiations and that even in the order it's alleged that various options were provided to uh, Mr. Coons. But ultimately, the decision, as the district admits, the decision, the final decision to deny the permit application for 3.7 acres of use was Mr. Coons's refusal to acquiesce in the condition that he performed 50 acres of off-site improvements. And by the way, the re- reference where, — Where is that? It's in the Joint Appendix, pages 70 to 71, which is the pretrial statement where each party sets forth his and her position. There the court — I'm sorry, the district made clear that the condition that had been refused and was the cause of the permit denial was the one to perform off-site mitigation at a cost of a range between $10,000 on the low end our experts said in the range of 100 to 150,000, 90 to 150,000. So the district later on, even in the Florida Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg, said in its petitioner's brief on jurisdiction at page one that it required additional mitigation before it would authorize the permits and that, quote, additional mitigation would be off site because the available conservation land on site was in the district's view insufficient <coughs> mitigation. So there's no question that an actual condition was imposed whose rejection produced a permit denial. Mr. 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 Beard, I don't think anybody's contesting that there was a condition imposed, or maybe (coughs) there are, but, you know, there's another question whether that condition is a taking. And we've been trying to figure out what's the taking here. And Nolan Dolan, they took an easement. They took a piece of land. So that's the taking. Now, you said 
the funds are the taking. <laughs> is that correct? Any time that somebody comes up with a proposal uh, 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 for, for a developer to pay money in order to compensate the State for the costs that are associated with his development, that that is itself a taking? I want to be clear that we're not saying that all monetary fees or exactions would be subject to Nolan and Dolan. Only within the permit context, the special context of land use permitting. No, I understand. But in the permit context, a state can't say to somebody, you have to pay to perform some service or to compensate without it being a taking and without it being subject to Nolan Dolan analysis. Correct. If the state or if the government or the permitting authority asks for the, for the property owner to give up property, even money, to be put to a public use, and it's not an application for your user fee or something like that. It's for mitigation. That should so, be subject. So, so, for example, and I'll try to do this very quickly. If, if the state just had a policy for every acre of wetlands you fill in, uh, it, it costs us $10,000. You need to pay $10,000. That's subject to Nolan Dolan analysis, too. Correct. It would be subject to Nolan and Dolan analysis to determine if there really on the ground is a connection between the impact. No, it, it would be subject to Nolan and Dolan analysis if they took the $10,000. If they issued the permit, the developer went ahead with the development, and the state then attached uh, the bank account in the amount of $10,000 or whatever. That would be Nolan. In Nolan and Dolan, in Nolan, there was a taking. He had gone ahead with the, with the development of his house under the permit, which said if he did that, he gave away the easement. So there, there was a, 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 a taking there. The, the easement would have been taken automatically. In, in, in Dolan, there was uh, — the individual had not gone ahead with the development, but it was clear that any development the person undertook would be subject to — the uh, the exaction that the uh, municipality required, so there was a a taking there. We said, here, there's nothing that happens. The permit was denied. Unlike in unlike in uh, in Dolan, where the permit was granted, and it was understood that if she went ahead with it, she was going to lose uh, lose uh, uh, some land rights. Here, the permit's been denied. I can't see where there's a taking here. Nothing's been taken. In Nolan and Dolan, Your Honor, nothing was taken either. In Nolan, you had a permit approval with conditions. It's true that development had not, had not gone forward. But here as well, development had not gone forward. Presumably, in a, in theoretically, if the development had gone forward, he might have been subject to conditions that he would have had to satisfy. But I would submit to the Court The permit that, had issued. The permit had issued in both of those cases, and therefore the person was, take, was saying to go ahead with this permit. I give up. The, I give up this land. The permits in Nolan and Dolan actually did not issue. There was only approval with conditions, and there's a difference, and that's no different from what happened here. The threat is the same. You don't get a permit issued to you until there was no approval with conditions. There's one thing uh, for a municipality to issue a, an approval with conditions. And uh, a municipality saying, we can't approve it unless you agree to these conditions. And the person doesn't agree, and the municipality says, we don't approve it. But in either case, he, he faces the threat, <clears throat> the unconstitutional condition on his use of his property. You don't get your use until you comply with our conditions. Mr. Chief uh, Justice. I, 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 just, I have one question. I know we're, you're running short on your rebuttal time. Assume that when we look at this record, assume we think there's a due process violation, not a taking violation. That is not before us here, is it? No. The due, there is no due process claim here. There's only a state statute that embodies sort of a due process standard, but there is no due process claim here. And may I reserve the balance of my time here? And I'll afford you some additional time since our questioning intruded on yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Wilson? Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, the parties agree that Florida may require a landowner to perform mitigation as a condition for a permit that would allow the destruction of the wetlands. The parties disagreed 
as to how much mitigation was appropriate in this case. The district thought that Mr. Koontz's proposal was insufficient to mitigate the, de- the damage to wetlands. Mr. Koontz rejected the district's counterproposals, and he refused to do anything more. And the district denied his permit application because he refused to do anything more. Does it make any difference <clears throat> in his refusing to do anything more whether the condition is on-site or off-site? I don't think it makes any difference, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. I mean, the — under the Florida regulatory regime, we cannot — demand certain conditions from the landowner. Um, the, we are obligated — if the, if the permit the — per, the landowner has to establish under his permit application, and it's his burden, that he meets the various standards, the public interest standard, which includes uh, — Those no are all state, state law provisions we're talking about. Correct. What about is — there, is there anything in the Federal Constitution that limits the conditions that you can demand? I don't I, — not — not — if I understand um, — your question, Mr. Chief Justice, I don't think so. I think that the question is, when you're talking about what analytical rubric you should apply, whether it be Nolan or Dolan or Penn Central, I think you can always argue that the impact of any of the conditions that we would demand, and I will assume here that they are true demands, you can always argue that the impact of the conditions, be they on-site, off-site, or monetary would be so burdensome that it would call into play but that's, Penn Central. But or, there's no there's no restraint on the agency it can ask for the moon before well, it will before it will give a permit. Well, I, I don't. I mean, I think that Penn, first of all, I think there are many restraints on the agency. First of all, I think Penn Central imposes a restraint on the agency. Do you know of any case where the government's lost a Penn Central? Case. Yes, there are several in this case, Mr. Chief Justice. I mean, Hodel versus Irving is a Penn Central case, I believe. And I think Kaiser Aetna was also a Penn Central. Let now me they, uh, now present. They, so, so it does, it certainly does, and, and there are It doesn't happen very often. Well, it, it is, it's certainly the burden is on the landowner. But, but I think that Penn Central, I think that in Lingle, when this court tried to sort of restore, you know, some, some coherence to the, to the, taking jurisprudence and repudiated the Agin's point, the Court pointed out that, that the — what — that the normal — sort of the normal jurisprudence is that um, the government is not required to establish by a heightened scrutiny sort of that there's a connection between means and analysis when it engages in economic uh, — economic regulation. Just, now, just to — Dale it down. Your, your position is that there is no limit in the Federal Constitution on what the agency can demand as a condition for the issuance of a permit. No, no, no. I don't think that's our position. First of all, the Due Process Clause um, may certainly impose conditions. The Equal Protection Clause may certainly impose conditions. But, but the, taking, the Takings Clause does not. If the, if the conditions are so onerous that it would make it essentially impossible to derive any value from the land, that may very well call into question Penn Central or Lucas. Uh, and, I mean, in many ways, this case could have been litigated as a very straightforward Penn Central case. Suppose, suppose the agency said, um, we're really short of revenue. Uh, we'll let you develop your land if you contribute a million dollars to our new football stadium. Uh, Justice Kennedy, I think that that might very well raise a Penn Central or a Lucas claim. It also sounds well, like it doesn't raise Penn Central. You, you, you keep on running away from it by saying right. Penn Central or Lucas. Well, it's not it doesn't an, deprive the land of all value. Well, but it still has some value. Well, it, Penn it, Central's it, totally out of the case. I mean. It, it's not a no, it's not a Nolan or Dolan claim, is my point, Justice Kennedy, and it's not a Nolan or Dolan claim because it's not a it, it, the the as as my friend acknowledged the question in Nolan and Dolan is or the rationale of Nolan and Dolan is would the condition by itself, uh, if demanded unilaterally and outside the permitting context, would ha- would that have been a taking a property for which just compensation would have been required? Well, so I'm sure it would have been. <laughs> Sure, it would have been. If they just went along around to a landowner and the landowner is there minding his own business and they say, well, you own some property, so give us a million dollars to build a football stadium. I, I think that, that would be, that would be unconstitutional, right? I think that would, I mean, I think that would violate, could well violate the due process clause. It's hard to see what the, you know, what the rationality of it is. But I don't think that this court has ever extend, has ever extended the concept of a taking. To requirements that a land that a that anybody but or a landowner either pay money, or more importantly, because I think 
what really is this case is come into compliance with a regulatory requirement that would have the — that — which he would have to expend money to comply with. I'm trying so to understand what would be what, — what would be left of Nolan and Dolan if we agree with you. Let me give you three situations. First, petition uh, — the, the uh, district says we're granting your permit on the condition that you give us one-third of your land. That's Nolan and Dolan, right? Yes. Okay. Situation number two, permit is denied, but it will be granted if you give us one-third of your land. What about that? I think in that situation, if, in other words, if the situation is really exactly the same like Nolan and Dolan, but the permit is denied, but it's clear that it's a concrete, condi- concrete condition, the landowner can go up through the judicial review process and say, this is an, you know, the, the denial of the permit application is predicated on an unconstitutional condition, and you should set that aside. Is that the and, same as the first example for purposes of Nolan and Dolan? Almost. Al- right. Almost, Justice Alito. All right. Now let me get to my third. The permit is denied, but it will be granted if you give us the fair market value of the third of the land. And once you've done that, then we're going to condemn your land and pay you the fair market value for it. Justice Alito, I think that th- this Court's decision, there are, this Court has a decision in Village of Norwood essentially says if what is going on is just a pure contrivance to avoid the requirement of compensation in the Just Compensation Clause, that the Court has said, no, it will look through and it, to the substance of the demand and determine that there was, a, you know, essentially an evasion of the Just Compensation requirement. But as but I, I understand your position, Cash is magical, right? The, go- the government can come in and uh, come into my house, take all of the cash that's there, and that is not the basis for a takings claim, right? Because well, cash is not is not a taking. Does that make any sense? Well, uh, first of all, Ju- Justice Scalia, of course, this case we don't believe involves cash. It involves a requirement to do something that costs money, which is is different from cash. I mean, in, in cash is the problem with extending the problem with extending the takings concept to a monetary obligation, which can mm-hmm. be paid for out of right. sort of undifferentiated funds, right. is that it has it has no logical stopping point. I mean, the, the court, stopping point is don't right. take my cash. Well, but the your government, your, your, but your answer to my question is that's okay. It's not a taking, right? I, think I may have some other cause of action, but not a, no. not a taking. The government's coming and taking my money. It's not a it's not a Nolan and Dolan claim for the government to say, if you want if you. I'm want not a talking permit. Nolan and Dolan. I'm talking about your position that the taking of cash cannot be a taking. Well, if the go- I, I'm sorry, Justice Scalia, if the if the government is take is seizing the identifiable dollar bills that are in your in your house? I mean, that sounds more like a case like Webb. Oh, I see. Webb's Fabulous Pharmacy. That's okay. Where, but if they, if they say you have to turn over to us whatever money you have in your house, or you have to turn over to us whatever's in your bank account, that's not a taking. Justice Scalia, I think there are many, con- there are many constitutional claims that could be made. And I also want to add, there's an extensive overlay of state law in this area that protects landowners from arbitrary, irrational, intrusive, excessive uh, demands one of the by, things by government in, agencies. The, the Federal provision, the Takings Clause, is designed to prevent property owners from having to bear the costs that should be borne by the people as a whole, the football stadium example. There's no reason that a particular landowner should have to pay for the football stadium simply because he owns property. The takings clause is designed to make sure that those exactions aren't imposed on property owners but spread more evenly across the citizens who benefit from it. And I guess I don't understand why you say that the takings clause is the one provision that doesn't apply in that type of situation. Mr. Chief Justice, the, the Armstrong policy of the, um, that, the gov- that, that an individual person should not be forced to bear what society should, is, what should be spread to society as a whole, is not violated when the government insists that a landowner comply with a generally applicable regulation. Now, it, of course, the generally the- applicable regulation in the football stadium hypothetical is not generally applicable. It says you are the owner of this property, and if you want to develop it, you've got to build a football stadium. Well, I, I think that is saying to one particular landowner, you may have to build a football stadium where no other 
type of similar regulation or requirement would ever be imposed on any other landowner sounds, you know, like an, you know, sounds like an equal protection claim if the government just picks out one landowner. Well, why is it okay if they do it to five or six other landowners? Well, and okay? then I think you have to yeah. ask what, but then, Justice Scalia, I think you have to ask what, what regulatory scheme is the government well, well, let's, imposing let's, 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 in order let's to put do it, that? Let's put it this way. I take it it's, it's uh, a given that the government cannot take an easement on your property. It cannot use your property for its own purposes. It cannot park its trucks there. It cannot cut the grass. It, uh, why is it that if it can't do those, it can still force you, as a condition to using your property to its highest and best use, to pay them money? Well, I think... Uh, why isn't that an equal burden? Why isn't that an equal use of the property by the government? I think it, I think for several reasons, Justice Kennedy. First of all, I think that the this nation has a long legal tradition of um, giving unique legal protection to property as opposed to money. I mean, there are many circumstances, many circumstances where the government can say to an individual, "You must give me a thousand dollars," but cannot say, to, or a group of individuals, or but cannot say to the same group or individual, you must give me land worth $1,000. I mean, there, there, I mean, that's, that is what the Just Compensation Clause Really? I, oh, yes. gee, that doesn't strike me as, as uh, entirely true. Well, Justice, Justice Scalia, the government obviously — I mean, a tax that's imposed only on landowners and that's, uh, you know, uh, it's a tax of uh, $5,000 per landowner, if that were replaced by a provision that said um, every, every landowner shall uh, — uh, contribute to the state uh, um, a portion of his property worth five thousand dollars. I think the, that would the latter is bad and the former is okay. I think that would raise very serious questions. At least, I mean, I, I don't know that this court has ever has ever been faced with exactly such a case, but I think that would raise very serious questions. No, but uh, am I wrong about? Uh, I might have this. I thought the framework roughly is the following: It is not the case that Penn Central applies only where there's a physical invasion of property or there is total destruction of the value of the property. In those two situations, what we said in Lucas is it applies uh, without case-specific inquiry. But there are another set of cases where Penn Central and McMahon apply with case-specific inquiry. And those to discover whether you have one, you look into such things as whether the regulation destroys investment-backed expectations, and then you look to the nature of the government interest and the relationships, etc. That's what I thought the framework was. Now, if that's the framework, then when the government says, I will let you develop your land, if and only if you give $50,000 to the Shriners Hospital, you would say, I can't develop my land. And besides, that significantly interferes with my investment-backed expectation. And besides, there's no relation whatsoever. Therefore, I win under the takings clause. Now, I spell all that out because I, if I'm wrong about that framework, if I'm right about the framework, that can apply to this case. If I'm wrong about the framework, I want to know where in the cases I'm wrong. Justice Breyer, we think that you are right about that framework. That and and just six weeks ago in the that Arkansas surprises me. In the well, just six weeks ago in the Arkansas Fish and Game Commission case, this court reiterated that Penn Central is presumed to be the test. Right. So if I'm right about the framework, that takes care of all the hypotheticals you were asked. Uh, in those cases, there is a significant interference with investment-backed expectation, and there is no justification whatsoever, so the takings clause applies. I, I, we agree, Justice Scalia, and we don't — Justification is the protection of wetlands. Well, maybe — That's a justification, the protection of wetlands. There is no necessary comparison, as Nolan and Dolan requires, between the harm uh, uh, that would be occasioned if the permit were granted — and what the state is exacting in order to mitigate, that, that doesn't exist anywhere in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the analysis that you're talking about. 
Well, Justice Scalia, there are — there is another problem with the Nolan and Dolan claim in this case, which is it's hard to see how you can have an exactions takings claim when nothing has ever actually been exacted from it. Now, that is a problem. Now, and — and — and that — right. And — and so — and in this case, the — if the — if the — claim for the taking is — for the compensation is based on Nolan and Dolan, it seems that there's a mismatch and that what the petitioner is trying to do is sort of take the Nolan-Dolan heightened scrutiny government — government bears the burden of proof analysis and sort of convert that into what is the regulatory takings analysis for the entire parcel of his land, which is — which is the measure of damages that he received. So I think that there is a mismatch. I know I, this I is — think that your point goes to the question that's been raised about — there was no permit issued. He has, didn't accept the, the permit. And I don't understand that proposition. Are you saying that if you are confronted with an unconstitutional condition, you have to accept it and then you can challenge it? You can't simply say you denied that on the basis of an unconstitutional condition and that's wrong. No, that's not our argument, Mr. Chief Justice. Florida has opened a avenue for judicial relief for you to go up through the Florida APA process, just like the federal APA, where you can say, stop, stop the district from doing this to me. They are predicating their, either their grant okay, or Okay, I'm grant trying grant to get to the federal. You, you right. often re- fall back to the state provisions. I'm looking no. at the federal Constitution, and assuming the state provisions give you no relief, is it your position that he has no claim unless he accepts a permit with unconstitutional if, conditions? If there's no — if there's no kind of avenue, as I was saying, then I think we — then you have to obtain comp- — you have to seek compensation, but your compensation is for the value of your land that was taken. And in Lingle, this Court reiterated that the takings clause is not a substantive limitation <laughs> on the government's power to regulate. The, ta- the, the takings clause, or as I should call it, the just compensation clause, is a requirement that if the, that the government will pay you just compensation for any property or property interest it has seized from you. It does not, it does not itself impose a, a requirement that the government substantively justify its regulation. Mr. Wolfson, why isn't it uh, entirely reasonable to say If you're going to put a condition on a permit, that condition has to have some rough proportionate relationship to the harm that is being done to the permit. But what's, that seems to me perfectly sensible, that if they're, gonna, if they're going to exact a condition, the condition has to have some roughly proportional relationship to the harm. Justice Ginsburg, I, I think that the district thought that they were acting roughly proportional. In other words, we're, we're not saying that the government shouldn't act, that government should not act reasonably. But I think that when you force these cases into court under the Nolan Dolan framework, you have a, you have basically kind of a, a mismatch and extraordinarily complex situation and you have you run right into what this court said in Lingle, which is that it is not ordinarily the court's, the, the appropriate um, approach to require the government to bear the burden of proof. Well, in Penn Cole versus Mann, the government didn't enter the property. It didn't take the property in the physical sense of, of moving in and appropriate. It just says, congratulations, you have some coal under your land, and we hope you enjoy it because you can't move it. And we said that is a taking. That is a regulation that goes too far. And it deprived, as Justice Breyer indicated, the owner of investment back to expectations, although that word wasn't in Ben Mann. Correct. And, Justice Kennedy, nobody is disputing that Mr. Kuntz could have made the argument that the regulation goes too far in the sense of the burden on his proposed project. I mean, he had all of those arguments available to him. He bought the — he says he bought the land before the regulation went into effect. He had investment back to expectations. Uh, and all the rest of it. But that is not the claim that he is advancing to this Court. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. <coughs> Mr. Needler. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, I'd like to emphasize at the outset that Petitioner's argument that Nolan and Dolan should apply in this context 
would, would constitute a radical change in the, in the way standard, generally ap- applicable regulatory programs are operated. It is standard procedure when someone applies for a permit from the government, it is the permit <coughs> applicant's burden to establish that he complies with the regulatory program. Nolan and Dolan shift that burden to the government. That has never been the case under regulation, including land use regulation. What was taken in Nolan and Dolan? If the, if in the, Nolan, was it the easement that was taken? That is what it, if if the if the permit had issued and the and an, and an easement was granted, yes, it was the easement. E, well, but it, it uh, wasn't what was taken uh, unreasonably the ability of this homeowner to make the uh, alterations to his house that he wanted to make. He wanted to add another story. And the court and the uh, the state said you can't do it, and its only basis for saying you can't do it was because you wouldn't give us the easement. The the the, the basis of the, the the theory of Nolan and Dolan, and the court made this clear in uh, in Lingle um, and and in Del Monte Dunes for that matter, is those two cases apply in the specific situation where there is an exaction of a right of access, an easement for the public to enter the land as a condition. And the, the, the reason for that, the Court explained in, in Lingo, were really two reinforcing points. The first was that there would be public access, which is a, a permanent physical occupation, which is one of, one of the uh, exceptions to the general Penn Central test for regulatory takings. The other is that it was a per se um, uh, taking. The, the, it, it was per se that the government could not have acquired that easement for paying co- without paying compensation. Therefore, the government could not attach as a condition to the granting of a permit uh, that the person convey something unless it was proportional. So the, th- the theory began with the idea that the easement itself uh, uh, would have been a — the taking of that would have been a per se taking. This is a very different situation because the other way in which petitioner's theory would constitute a radical departure is that uh, — Compliance with regulatory programs frequently, maybe almost always, requires the expenditure of money. If someone wants to build a power plant, uh, a coal-fired power plant, he's going to have to install a scrubber to protect the air, to prevent no diminution of air quality. Constructing that costs money. It can't be that the requirement to spend money to comply with a regulatory program is itself uh, a taking. The taking would well, what be about a- What about the football stadium? Do they, can you pick a particular landowner? I mean, you took a case in which there's no question under Nolan and Dolan about the relationship, proportionality, and nexus. Let's put those to one side because the issue is whether Nolan and Dolan apply. Uh, can the government say, okay, you want a permit? Uh, we'll give you the permit if you fund the new football stadium. I, I think in that situation there would be a very substantial equal protection challenge because one landowner is being singled out. With but no the one constitutional basis. provision that is concerned with protecting property owners from having to bear burdens that should be borne by the public at large is not applicable. Well, it, uh, that apl- it, it applies when there is ident- identifiable property um, Taken if no, no, why, why isn't the answer? Yes, it is applicable. Of course it's applicable. I own a piece of land. And they have significantly interfered with my investment backed right, expectation. Right. I, I, and, and to say that you, I can't put a house on this because I'm supposed to pay for a football field, which has nothing to do with it, is as close to insisting, uh, that you have to, uh, have 4,000 columns of coal in your mine so that you can never use it, as I can think of. Say, so it's, it's homes brought up to date. Well, I mean, cer- at least cer- that argument would be made. Cer- why wouldn't it be a winning argument? Certainly a Penn Central argument uh, could be made there, but I think that's very different from a Nolan argument. Yeah, which, I agree with which, you. Which, which imposes the, the burden on the government and basically treats the, the payment of money as itself. Mr. Neath, uh, can I go back to the questions presented a moment? Um, the Court below did two separate rulings, I think. One is there can't be a taking if the, um, if the claim is that it's a, of a undifferentiated money, not a risk. And I think you would agree with that. If the only issue is um, an obligation to pay money, that that's not a takings claim, correct? Yes. And this is not even an obligation to pay money. It's an obligation to spend money. Right. To come there was a second holding, however, which really gets ellipsed by the second 
which is a denial of a permit, doesn't permit you to raise the Nolan Dolan case. And it appears to me, even if there is a easement situation, some even if there is an actual takings claim at issue. Do you agree with that first holding by the court below? We, Assuming we narrow it not to undifferentiated money, but is there a difference between a denial or a grant? No. If, 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 if the, if the uh, agency decision is written where there is an express condition, we don't think that it matters. Uh, an express condition satisfying Nolan and Dolan, in other words, an exaction, a per se taking, we don't think it matters whether the whether the uh, whether it's a permit grant or permit denial, there was no actual taking in the sense the compensation would be owed, but it could be challenged as an unconstitutional condition under the Nolan and Dolan uh, analysis. But we think it's critical when thinking about that that the that the permit denial that that only applies if the permit denial expressly uh, is based on the condition, because otherwise you would get into a situ- situation of negotiations and what was discussed and the, and. Liability could turn on an exchange of ideas, whereas it should turn on the formality of the agency's final decision. It's akin to the Williamson County final decision requirement. Do you agree your, your, your friend on the other side cited a number of places in the record where he thought your condition was satisfied, that the denial of the permit was expressly based on the failure to comply with the offered conditions? Well, um, the — if you look at the uh, the orders denying the um, permit applications in the record, I, I believe it's um, 49 to 51 and 69 to 61. In those situations, it says the permits were denied because the plaintiff uh, did not give the reasonable assurances that the statute requires uh, in order to get the permit. The reasonable assurances of, of a lo- no loss of wetlands functions. One of the Why ways. Why isn't I this unreal? I mean, you're saying. Uh, all along in the negotiations, the agency says, if you do X, you get the permit. And X is, would, would, would be an unconstitutional condition. Okay? He refuses to do X. The permit is denied with a general statement like this. The permit is denied because he has refused to do the, the necessary mitigation. Isn't it clear that the reason he's refused to do the necessary mitigation is he has refused the last demand of the agency. The ultimate standard under the statute is whether he has provided reasonable uh, assurances. What assurances? The way in which he goes about it, whether off-site or on-site. The off-site part just arises because this is a wetlands case. Normal regulation wouldn't raise the off-site, uh, on-site problem. But the, the ultimate question is he didn't carry his burden of establishing no net loss of wetlands. Well, 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 wait, he's going to say, in part, I guess, there, I did a little numbers from your brief. The 37 million acres in Florida, say about 4 million are bodies of water, and say a third of them are built up, and we have 11 million that are wetland and 11 million that aren't. That's crude. So they're saying, why in heaven's name are we supposed to be, everybody wants to build, and why should the people that happen to live on wetland have to pay for all the other wetland? That's just coincidence. So he's going to say that that is uh, like the Shriners Hospital. You're going to say, no, it isn't like the Shriners Hospital. Now, all I'm saying is, isn't at least an issue under the takings clause, whether it is or isn't? I think it's clearly not like the Shriners uh, Hospital. Shriners I know you'll Hospital. say that, and they'll say it is. Shriners Hospital. But <laughs> right. I, I did want to come back uh, to Justice Scalia's question. The permit, uh, permit denials, just general permit denials, the Court made clear in Del Monte Dunes are not covered by Nolan and Dolan. Uh, they are covered by Penn Central. So, and the Court made clear in Nolan that the Court could have denied the permit without attaching the condition. We think it's important that the agency always have that option. And the third point but is — You may be this, right, but you're making Nolan and Dolan a, a trap only for really stupid districts, you know. If they, they say the right words, then they're out from under it. Isn't that right? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think so, because, uh, because there are situations in which a, 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 an agency actually wants to get the easement. But this Court in Lingle made clear that, uh, that the general rule is Penn Central, with only the two exceptions for regulatory Why should it matter whether, the, whether the, the permitting authority says expressly in the denial it's denied because you didn't do this, or it just says it's denied, but it's perfectly well understood what was needed, what they were going to demand in because order to get it? 
I may answer. Because the agency has to reserve, has to have the ability to, to uh, deny the permit because the conditions required by the statute were not met. And Nolan and Dolan um, uh, deal with formality and the formality of conveyance of an easement if there's not a document that requires that then the strict requirements of, for the narrow exception of Nolan and Dolan do not apply. Thank you, Mr. Needler. Mr. Baird, you have uh, well, three minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I would just like to point the Court, and particularly Justice Scalia, to pages uh, 30 and 31 of our brief on the merits, where we describe with citations to uh, the uh, Nolan and Dolan what precisely happened there I want to make sure that it's clear that what they did there was not issue permits. They approved with conditions. But the property owner still had to satisfy the conditions in order to receive the permit. As to the question about — What do we do with what uh, Mr. Needler says is a ruling in your favor on this question, that all denials are subject to Nolan and Dolan? what do we do with that? I mean, what's the fun? I see an enormous floodgate here, and one in which we are sending a signal that perhaps states should be more quiet rather than more engaging. They should just say no, because anything they offer is going to be seen as an uncon- potentially as an unconstitutional taking. So they should just plain say no, not explain why, not engage in any uh, work with you, to mitigate. Justice Sotomayor, I, I don't believe that negotiations will suddenly break down and we'll see a flurry of, of permit denials if the Court rules in our favor. What will happen instead, it's true, I should say, they will lose flexibility in demanding whatever, whatever it is that they want. Under the Takings Clause, they won't have any review. But the benefit of applying our rule that says monetary exactions should be treated like other exactions and be reviewed under Nolan and Dolan. But they're not. People are asked to pay taxes. Homeowners are asked to pay taxes all the time. Development fees, if they want to develop something, people are subject to uh, money exactions all of the time in this society. No question that we all are subject on a daily basis to government demands that we pay, that we have a financial obligation. So what happens in just when the legislature part passes a a, a development fee. Are you now saying that's subject to Nolan and Dolan, too? If the legislation requires an agency who processes the permit to impose a fee in exchange for a permit within, again, within the land use context, we're not talking taxes, homeowners' fees, we're talking within the discretionary land use process that is imposed there, then the risk of coercion, undue influence, and the like arise, and Nolan and Dolan should (coughs) apply. But I wanted to respond specifically to Justice Breyer's questions about Penn Central. I think conceptually there's an important difference between the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, which is what we seek to apply here, and what would be a permit uh, or what would be a Penn Central claim. The unconstitutional conditions doctrine, the the offense there is the — May I finish your thought? The offense there is the conditioning, the improper conditioning of a permit. It's not did the condition — force me to lose the value in my land? That's a very different question that a case like Penn Central might answer, subsequent to a permit denial. The unconstitutional conditions doctrine focuses exclusively on the permit exaction and on the conditioning, not on subsequent decisions by the government, for example, to deny. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Counsel, the case is submitted.